Metal casting my 3D prints has been something I've wanted to investigate for some time. The prospect of being able to take a complex digital form and turn it into metal opens up near limitless possibilities. I had considered where to begin several times, but ultimately there was an obvious choice for me when it came to deciding what to cast. The tapping arm, while perhaps not my most exciting print, has been my most used and most revised. As a casting project, I thought it was simple enough to be achievable, while still giving me a lot of opportunity to learn. I love the design language of casting and how it differs from my 3D printed offerings. The printed tools have huge bulky shapes, a necessity to overcome the weaknesses of the material being used. Working in metal, but especially cast metal, goes to the complete other end of the spectrum. Not only can the parts be more elegant, they have to be. Excessively thick and bulky parts are prone to voids and shrinkage, so designing things that can cool down evenly is essential. With the patterns ready, there's still a good bit more to prepare before we can pour any metal. Firstly, sand. I'm using what's called green sand. It's a very common home casting sand that you can make for very cheap. It's a mix of fine sand and between 10 to 20% bentonite clay, depending on who you ask. There's a good chance you can just buy powdered bentonite clay locally, but if you can't, it can instead be obtained by crushing clumping clay kitty litter. This bag cost me $4, and after running it through a blender, I was left with perfect clay dust. This clay is then mixed dry with my sand that I have sifted through a fine mesh sieve. I'm using 18% clay to sand because that was just how much clay I happened to crush, and it worked out well. I mix the two until I see no more swirls in the pot. Following this, I slowly add water using a spray bottle. I mix or mull the sand and water until I can get a clean break when snapping a clump in half. At this point, the green sand is ready, and we can begin building the first mould. This starts with applying a layer of baby powder inside the flask before placing the pattern and applying more powder. Baby powder is a common at-home mould release to keep the sand from sticking to the pattern or the other half of the mould. Following this, I start adding my sand. For my first mould, I added all my sand and then compacted it down, since I had read that you could get layer separation doing it in parts. I'm using a pestle and piece of wood as my sand rammers and neither of these are very good. They don't have the right shape or enough weight, and I will be replacing them in the future. Happy with how the sand felt, I scrape off the excess. Content with how the face looked, I screwed on the bottom of the drag before flipping the whole thing over. That's, that's looking pretty good! Not too bad. The cope was much the same process, aside from the inclusion of a tapered sprue that would be later used to pour the molten metal. More baby powder is added, followed by sand, before scraping off the completed form. Now we separate the two halves again and can get a look at our mold cavity. After removing the pattern, I can immediately see that I haven't rammed the sand hard enough, as there are clear voids in the cavity. However, I'm lazy, so I opt to push forward, figuring that I would have to file down the sides anyways. The final step before casting is cutting the runners and adding a riser. The runners are carved into the sand and connect the pouring basin to the cavity and riser. There can be one or more riser in a pattern, depending on its size, 
and they act as reservoirs of liquid metal to fill the extremities of a part as it rapidly cools. My runners were crude, but they did the job. Finally, we can put our mould back together and carve in the final feature, the pouring basin. This design is based on an excellent video by Old Foundry Man on YouTube, whose channel provided some of the best information on the topic of metal casting that I found. The basic logic behind this design is that it provides a large target and consistent flow of metal, making it easier to keep a full sprue, resulting in less air being pulled into the casting. With the flask full, we can fire up the furnace. I bought myself one of the Vivor 6kg models and while it works, they need a lot of prep that isn't included with the kit. The ceramic wool blanket included in the kit needs a rigidizer and refractory cement applied to it. Neither of these are included and cost me an extra $100. The included pouring tongs are also downright negligent in my opinion. You would need to buy or make a set of lifting and pouring tongs to handle the crucible safely. My pouring tongs are actually the ones that came with the set, but I've welded some simple additions to make them much safer. Very seared. There's certainly a casting, although... <laughs> Shit. Okay. Might be salvageable. Definitely... Not perfect. Let's have a little, little look. So an okay result for my first casting. Let's move on to the other parts. The second mould process is much the same as the first, with some small differences. First, I'm casting two parts at once. These parts are also made of two halves, so they need alignment pins to keep the parts in position. I'm also ramming the sand in layers this time, to try and get a better surface finish. We will see the consequence of this later. Sand's burnt. Oh, there's a there's a lot of bubbles. But it filled completely. I think I can work with this. I was gonna paint these parts, so Yes, interesting, there's a there's a lot more bubbles in the pot this time. I think that's it might be because I wasn't keeping the spout full enough. For this project, the parts are good enough. They will just require a lot of post-processing. This post-processing began with a lot of filing. Thankfully, I had no major voids or shrinkage. Mostly just extra flashing, meaning I could remove a lot of the major defects. I didn't film much of this process as it was tedious enough without posing for the camera, but after it the parts were already looking much better. With the parts mostly cleaned up, I could get on with machining. A few of you watching were probably hoping this was going to be done on my printed mill from earlier in the year. But being perfectly honest, that mill burnt me out pretty quick. Put simply, it was unmotivating to learn on since I was never sure if my problems were one of the dozens of milling variables or the mill made of plastic. That's where the sponsor of today's video, Carvera, comes in, who supplied me with the mill I'll be using for this project. 
Learning on the Carvera has actually made me excited to machine things, and I'm already working on improvements to my mill because of it. The first part I set up was the bed to be faced off, as this was the simplest setup to begin with. Because of its tapered sides, I was able to use two toe clamps to secure it to the corner of the bed. Running the program, I was holding my breath a bit. Crashing any of these cast parts would mean several hours of extra work just to get another try. My programming also reflects this, I'm taking very light cuts. I'd rather practice speed on something easier to replace. But sure enough, the machine slowly but surely took off layer after layer, removing all the sand defects and leaving me with a lovely smooth surface. At a later point, I set this part back up to bore two 6mm holes as well. The second part was significantly more complicated. Just coming up with a work holding solution took a bit of time, but I managed to make a design using 1-2-3 blocks and a printed guide that I thought would hold the work securely enough. At this point, I realised another problem. I didn't have enough Z height for the end mill to make it through the workpiece, so after some questionable use of the e-stop, I lowered the end mill in the collet and ran the program again from inside the part. Sketchy, perhaps, but it got me the desired result. Now with the top faced and bored, I could flip the part and use that new face as a reference for the base. Bolting it down, I again used some 1-2-3 blocks for extra support, before facing and boring the bottom of the arm. Unfortunately, it was at this point I had my first crash. Probably should test that first. Oh, yeah, there's the first crash. But no matter, I ran the program again as I had been doing. Unfortunately, I had not set my origin properly after the crash, so this hole was also off. But it's close enough to be salvageable. The second hole was bored with no issue. And with that, those CNC operations for this project are done. I was just left with a few manual drilling and tapping operations. Specifically, the pivot holes are drilled on the printed drill press before being tapped to M2 in the original tapping arm. I was now ready to sand and paint the parts. To begin this, I cover the base and arm in filler, before sanding it back to a smooth surface. Following this, I applied the first of several coats of filler primer. This stuff sands super easily, so at first I applied very thick coats, before sanding back the drips and lumps applying very light coats towards the end of the process. Finally, I can apply my paint, a gloss enamel in winter grey. I wanted a more bluey grey, but couldn't find a paint that I felt safe using, so I went with this light grey as I liked how it looked, and figured it'd be easy to paint over if I wanted a different colour. And with that done, finally, we can put all the parts together. For a first try, not too shabby I think, but still a lot of room for improvement. I truly learnt a lot doing this. But still, 
Overall, I'm very happy with this process. I'll finish up with some quick thoughts on the Carvera Air. As usual, I'd like to say that it's easy for me to have a good opinion of this product, since I got it for free. That being said, I have a very good opinion of this product. Its quick change tool system especially stood out to me compared to two wrenches and a collet chuck that I'm used to. The auto leveling is a great quality of life feature, and for a beginner having a set of tools with pre-programmed safe feeds and speeds made me much more excited to make paths with no fear of breaking tools. I do have some criticisms as well, mostly to do with the software. I found the layout rather unintuitive, finding things like how to manually set the Z height took me some time. There is also a lot of dead space on this screen and no need to have me change tabs when working. Overall, I'm very impressed with the Carvera Air. It's actually made me excited to machine things which none of my previous mills have ever really achieved. Thank you to my patrons, Carvera, and to you, as always, for watching.